I'm going to begin today Ephesians chapter 2, and as you're turning there, this is a, a scripture that I shared back in July, and we're going to dive into it a little more today, Ephesians chapter 2, and as you're turning there, Jesus is returning for what kind of church? A glorious church. A glorious church is a church that is full of the glory of God. Dr. Savell, if you ever heard him talk about the glory of God, he said that the glory of God is God's manifested presence, God's manifested power, and His manifested goodness. It's God's manifested presence, it's His manifested power, and His manifested goodness. Say that with me. It's God's manifested presence, it's His manifested power, and it's His manifested goodness. That's the glory of God. So the glorious church is a church that is full of God's manifested presence, His manifested power, and His manifested goodness. Now, if you were to do a temperature gauge of the body of Christ at this time, uh, I would say that we're not quite there yet. But we are on our way there. And the word of the Lord that Dr. Savell gave for 2024 will now be a perpetual word of the Lord until Jesus returns. I want to read this to you again with that in mind. It's, a, it's progressing, advancing, experiencing promotion, seeing your highest expectations fulfilled. So we're on our way to being a glorious church. How many of you agree we're not there yet, but we're on our way? That's advancing. That's progressing. That's experiencing promotion because God's presence in the earth has increased. His power in the earth has increased. His goodness in the earth has increased. And remember the, the prerequisite for all of this. And this is something that we need to stay in faith. He said, stay in faith, remain focused on the promises and don't allow the enemy to distract you. There will be many distractions in the day ahead as darkness covers the earth, gross darkness the people. Many distractions to get you out of faith so that Satan can distract you so that your faith becomes inoperable. He doesn't want God's people acting in faith. That's Satan's greatest fear. But if he can get you distracted, if he can get your eyes off, off of Jesus, off of where we're going, off of Jesus' return, Jesus, uh, you can read Matthew 24, but he talked about the signs of the times. He said, when you see these things, look up, for your redemption draws near. That should be more exciting news than this for you. Look up, for your redemption draws near. Where are your eyes focused on? Our eyes have to be on the one who is coming back in all his glory for a church that is full of all his glory. When he returns, we will be full of his presence, full of his power, and full of his goodness. When we talk about the goodness of God, we're talking about the favor of God. Amen. Is that enough time for you to get to Ephesians chapter 2? Okay. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, And raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, last time I, I gave this scripture, I talked about he might show, and I want to just give you some definitions on that again. The words he might show, if you're taking notes, it means to make fully evident showing conspicuous proof which demonstrates something as undeniable. To make fully evident, showing conspicuous proof which demonstrates something as undeniable. He might show. It is an open display for all to see so obvious that no one can miss it. It's an open display for all to see, so obvious that no one can miss it. And it's a high level of personal interest, 
shown by the one making something very evident. It's a high level of personal interest. In other words, God's not delegating this out. He's taking a personal interest. He himself is taking a personal interest in showing. Now this word, uh, the riches of his grace, Brother Jerry taught us we could substitute the word favor when we saw grace in most cases. This word favor gives us a picture of God always leaning in toward his people. God always leaning in toward his people. And it's from a place where, from above, where he's coming down, kind of like with his hands on his knees, leaning in toward you like a little child. Which Jesus told us to be like one, did he not? And then the word kindness means he is uh, ready to meet real needs. So if we put these things together, it is God making fully evident and conspicuously open display for all to see, believers and non-believers, of his high level of interest toward his people. And he's leaning in, ready to re meet real needs. How's he going to meet those needs? Conspicuously, evidently, and undeniably. So that everybody will know the God we serve. And I played basketball in college, and uh, most of you know that. My freshman year, I didn't get to play a lot, but uh, I wanted, and a lot of freshmen don't get to play, you know, unless they're just really coming out of high school, ready, you know, talented and all that. And uh, so I, I sat on the bench, but here's how I sat on the bench when I, when I, I, would, I wouldn't sit back, I wasn't slouched back or anything. I, I was sitting like midway in the chair because I wanted to play. So I would sit here and when that, when that horn would blow, meaning there was a substitution, I would make eye contact with the coach. <laughs> Wherever I was on the bench, down at the end or next to him, I'm making eye contact like I am ready. I am ready to go in. My, th my theme was put me in coach. I'm ready to play. And um, that's, that's really a, a picture of if you think of that you're the coach and God is on your bench, say to, so to speak. He's leaning in. He's leaning up. He's making eye contact with you saying, I am ready to play. I am ready to make evident and conspicuous and undeniable. I am ready to meet needs. He's leaning in. But how many of us say, I got this, God. Don't, no, no, don't worry about it. I got this. He's ready. It's time for us to release him. He, the Bible says he not only is with us, but in us, all around us. It is time for us to release what he's going to do in the earth. He's not only ready to meet your needs, but he's ready to meet others' needs through you. So when Brother Jerry, <clears throat> when Brother Jerry went to heaven and I shared this message and I went a little different direction back in July with this, but after I got done, I had to drive up to Michigan. It's a long drive. So I try to make it to Nashville usually and spend the night. And there is a high-rise hotel that I like to stay at that, that we stayed at one time. <laughs> it's got a nice steakhouse at the top. So, so I made a reservation for a, a king non-smoking. And so when I got there, I wasn't looking great. I, I had driven nine hours uh, I had basketball shorts on, a t-shirt and a hat. Uh, possibly wasn't the cleanest smelling person. <laughs> when I got to the counter and gave them, you know, you give them your license and your, your credit card and the girl's, you know, looking up what my room is and she's making the keys and everything and I'm waiting patiently and she hands me the key. 
And uh, she said, here's your room number, and thank you very much. So I take my overnight bag, and I'm going up to the floor that, that she put me on. And I get up to the floor, and, and uh, I go down, and the room's at the end of the hall. And so I go in the room, and I enter into a hallway. Now, what I had been talking to the Lord about on the way up there was, okay, this, this, I had just done this message on favor here at the church. And, you know, uh, when I first began ministering uh, almost 25 years ago, my very first message, like a lot of young preachers that preach Brother Jerry's messages all over the world, that was my very first message, talking about going to the other side. I'm going to go to the other side. Now, I saw him at another church in Michigan, and he took his left hand. He would do this. I'm going to the other side. Going to the other side. Matthew 14. The storm came up. I'm going to the other side. Got these crazy disciples, but I'm going to the other side. And uh, so, you know, I'm asking the Lord, you know, this. he was Dr. Favor all over the world. And, and so I'm asking the Lord, uh, hey, hey, big. I like those shoes, brother. <laughs> okay. I like those shoes. <laughs> so I'm asking the Lord, uh, Lord, uh, how do I know that I have favor? You know, I've heard Brother Jerry preach it, you know, but I want to know it for me. Like, what's the... And uh, the Lord said, well, that's the same thing that Moses asked. And uh, he said, Moses said, how do I know I found grace or favor in your sight? And the Lord answered him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. It's so simple. And I'm going to repeat a couple of things that I said, but, you know, when I was with Brother Jerry on the airplane one time, I was explaining to him some things I was going through. And this and that, and he listened very graciously. And then he responds, yeah, but you have favor. And that's all he said. You have favor. And it wasn't until that time where I began to really, like some of these messages we hear and it sounds good, but it's gotta, it's gotta become revelation where it drops into your spirit, where it becomes part of your belief system. That's exactly. That everywhere you go, you have favor. And so he said, Moses asked that same thing as I'm having this conversation with God headed to Nashville. He said, my presence will go with you and I will get your presence going with me. Your presence is going with me. And the Bible says that mountains melt like wax at the what? Presence of the Lord. It says a fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. So we're talking about that we carry the presence of the Lord. And that's, I talked a little bit about that. So I'm having this conversation. And uh, so when I get there, and I, now I'm walking in this hallway in this room, and I look. And I don't know which way to go. Like I'm thinking maybe this is like, this. sometimes they have little cubby holes with rooms. And uh, so I walk this way, there's a kitchen. And I keep walking and there's a, a kitchen table. And then I look over here and there's like this sectional with a TV. I look over here, there's like a bookshelf with a desk. And uh, he, he liked to have desks in his room so he could have his Bible out making notes and stuff. So I walk down this other, this other hall and there's a bathroom and get to the end of the hall and there's the bedroom and going this way and here's the bathroom. There's a soaking tub right there and a big shower. I didn't use a soaking tub if you're wondering. It was nice though. <laughs> and all of this was overlooking the city on the 32nd floor. Do you have pictures? Do we have those pictures to show? I just want you to see this. There's the desk. When I saw that desk, I just saw him sitting there writing notes. Go ahead. There's a soaking tub. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? So, pause right there. So the next morning, I got out my laptop because uh, we were putting together a... Uh, a legacy uh, magazine for Dr. Savell, and my article was on the legacy of favor. 
So I got out my laptop and I wrote that article from right there at this desk overlooking the city of Nashville. And then the next picture, the presidential suite. How do I know I found favor in his sight? How do I know? Because God was leaning in on this trip. He was leaning in to do something evident, conspicuous, to show to all the people that he's ready to meet real needs, not only meet your needs, but there's things that you want. And he says he'll do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. The favor is for Come you Come on. so that you can walk and be a light in this earth that's dark. Can you say amen? amen. Give the Lord a good hand clap today. So this verse, back to Ephesians chapter 2, this verse is talking about in the ages to come. Well, what is the ages to come? It's now. It's not when we get to heaven. I don't need favor when I get to heaven. The ages to come, it's talking about now. Say now. now. The time is now. now. The time is now. And I keep saying it because I want to get this in you that he might show. The time is now for him to show up and show out. That's what we like to say. That's what I used to do on the basketball court when Nikki would come watch. I'd show out. I show out. Some of y'all think y'all got some moves. You ain't seen moves. You ain't seen moves so, so quick. I try to show out. Well, that's what God's going to do for his people in the earth. He is going to show up and he's going to show out. Evidently, conspicuously, and undeniably. He's ready to meet real needs. He's not only ready to meet your need, he's ready to give you, get your heart's desires to you. Amen. Go with me to Exodus chapter 3. Thank you for the prayers this past week. The meeting in Pennsylvania went well. It was a camp meeting for an Assembly of God church up there. It went great. And I got to preach on my birthday. I'm now 50. 50. I'm on the fifth floor. How many of you are on the fifth floor or above? Yes, don't be afraid. Life just keeps getting better, doesn't it? 50, it's my year of Jubilee. All my debts are canceled this year. I say that over you too, amen? Exodus chapter 3, verse 21. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. Now, part of being a glorious church is not a church that's going out sad, sick, and broke. It's a church that's going out in, in the fullness of the glory of God. And he says, I'll give you favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And look what he told them to do. Every woman shall ask of her neighbor who dwells near her house, articles of silver, gold, clothing. You shall put them on your sons, your daughters, and you shall plunder the Egyptians. Now go over with me to Exodus chapter 8. We're about three plagues in now, what's happening in Egypt. And this, these are probably some of the worst times Egypt has ever had with the plagues that came in. So we're about the fourth plague in. And God says in verse 22, In that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people, or the people of Egypt, or we can say the people of the world. God's going to make a difference between his people and the people of the world. Let me say this again. God's going to make a difference between his people and the people of the world. 
I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. So God set a time for this to happen. He set a time for, his, for this to happen. When God says that on a certain time something's going to happen, it's going to happen. There's no man that can stop it. There's no devil that can stop it. There's no government that can stop it. If he says it's going to happen, it will happen. Verse chapter 9. Verse 3. The hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, on the sheep. Verse 4. The Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Then the Lord appointed a set time saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. I decree to you by, the, by a word the Lord gave me just a few, couple weeks ago that we have entered a set time of favor for God's church. We've entered a set time of favor for the church where God will make a difference between his people and the people of Egypt. Now, this goes right along with what Pastor Justin preached about God opportunities, because here's what Brother Jerry, whoo, I'm fired up right now. Here's what Brother Jerry taught us. The blessing and favor are the winning combination. It was one of his last sermons. Blessing and favor, the winning combination. Eric was with us when we went to Rockford, Illinois, where he preached this, and he said, you know, I've heard him preach that before, but something, something just hit me where I, where I just understood it tonight. I don't know what it was. It was the Holy Spirit giving Eric revelation because the blessing and favor are a winning combination, and he taught us that. The blessing empowers us to prosper, yes. and favor opens doors or gives us opportunities for the, fav for the blessing to go to work in, in our lives in the earth. And that's what we were just, he was just talking about a couple, was a couple Sundays ago. God opportunities. Because it's a set time of favor. Favor opens doors that can't be opened by man. And, and there's even doors that can be shut that no man can open. God can do it. And it's a set time of, in the earth for that. Can you say amen? For example, we were just uh, one of the ministers that came to Pennsylvania lives in Bradenton, Bradenton, Florida. They were directly hit by the hurricane that just came through. And he pleaded the blood of Jesus over his house, over his property, spoke to the hurricane that it would not touch his property. And he reported to all of us that his neighbors and those around him had major damage, but his house and his property wasn't touched. What is that? It's God making a difference between his people and the people of the world. How do you think that we're going to be attractive to people if God doesn't do this? That's the reason I know what I'm talking about. I know because the Bible says we're going out of glorious church. This isn't a word of the Lord for 2025. This is a word of the Lord until Jesus returns. It's perpetual, just like Brother Jerry, advancing. We're going to progress. We're going to be promoted. We're going to experience our highest expectations being met. And up and up and up we will go until we hear that sound of the trumpet, the trumpet call. we got to start talking about this again because we used to talk about it. We used to sing songs about heaven. Now we don't, now we'll pull those songs out, you know, because uh, <laughs> they're old. They're old, Brother Eric. Big guy, big old big guy leading the choir. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that would be. <laughs> we all sing Jesus. We're at Walk Streets of Gold. Hey, we got to get our eyes back on the prize. Yes, sir. Where yes, sir. we're going. 
Yeah, oh, you can try to hit me, devil, but I know where I'm going. Shake it off. Shake it off. Because if you got your eyes on something, you got to focus that nobody can distract you. That's, that's how sometimes we sit down, we're real hungry. Got your eyes focused on that meal? For me, it's chips and salsa. You, you can talk to me, but my, my eyes are going to be glazed over. I ain't hearing a word you're saying. I'm just, I'm just having fun. Acts 10, 38. You say, that's great, Brother Eric, but that's Old Testament. Show me something in the New Testament. Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Say power. power. So God's presence, the glory, God's presence, his power, and his goodness. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. You ought to be able to put your name in there now. How God anointed Justin of what city are you from? Vancouver. How God anointed Justin of Vancouver with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. How God anointed Troy of Fort Worth who went about doing good. He anointed with the Holy Spirit and power and went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Watch this. For God was with him. God was with Moses. God was with Jesus. And the Bible promises you and I that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So we got a promise that he'll always be with us. And Jesus said, it's not me that does the work. It's my father in me that does the work. So you don't have to be the healer because the healer is on the inside of you. All you have to do is be the one that's obedient. And you'll go about doing good. You'll go about healing all who are oppressed by the devil. Jesus even said, greater works will you do because I go to my Father. I'm sending you a helper. Well, that's what we see right here. The Holy Spirit power went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil. So this difference that God is making with his people and the people of the world. Isaiah 60 prophesies it. In the Amplified Classic, it says, Arise from the depression and prostration which circumstances have kept you. Would you say that that's a scripture that applies to the church? We're still talking about 2020. The church is. Now, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, going out and things. When you go out, you see the, kind of the state of the body of Christ when you get to be in so many churches. And I don't know how many I went with, Brother Jerry. Uh, my guess is 250-ish, upwards of that. And you see, you see what's going on. You see what people are saying. You see what pastors are saying. You see the state of the people. And this scripture, can you put it up? Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise from the depression and prostration which circumstance have kept you. Rise to a new life. Shine, be radiant with the glory of the Lord. What's the glory of the Lord? God's manifested presence, his manifested power, and his manifested goodness. For your light has come. This is a day of light. We are in a day of light where light invades darkness. When light invades darkness, darkness flees. We were in New York City 2018, I think, and, and I was sitting there having a coffee in Times Square, and Nikki and Drew were in some shop or something, and, and uh, I'm noticing as I'm sipping coffee, there's this guy that's walking back and forth, like pacing back and forth as I'm sipping my coffee, and he's looking at me, he's mumbling to himself, and I look up and I catch his eye, and I'm like, 
Surely he's not looking at me, take another sip, and I look back. He's looking at me. He's got his eyes in on me. And I think this is kind of weird. <laughs> and I'm sipping my coffee, and so I start praying, Lord, what is this? What is this? He said, it's spiritual. He said, you've invaded this territory of this demonic force that's operating in this man. I said, okay. So I start praying in tongues. And then I lock eyes with him. And as he's mumbling to himself, I'm mumbling to myself, praying in the Holy Spirit. The fire of God comes on me. The pres- that's the presence of God. It comes on me. I feel right now. And, and I'm just telling you, he made a couple more paces and then he took off. So either... He's got to, either this man has to give this thing up or he's got to go with it. You see what I'm saying? (laughs) Uh, Another time we were in, I went with Kenny to Seattle back in 2020, two months after COVID hit. Seattle had blocked off, they had blocked off the streets. They had taken over the police station, graffitied the police station. They made, they made their own city. They called it the chop zone. And you remember that? And so I was praying one morning, and the Lord says, if Kenny asked you to go with him to Seattle, I want you to go. I said, I don't want to go. <laughs> well, who does? I mean, think about it, you know. Right. These guys have assault rifles. Antifa was there. Uh, so anyway, I get to the office at nine, shortly after 9 o'clock. I, my phone rings. It's Kenny. He says, hey, dude, where you at? <laughs> I'm at the office. Hey, man, I was just praying this morning. The Lord, you know, hey, if you want to, you know, I'm going to Seattle. If you want to go with me, you know, you're welcome to go. I was like, Kenny, I'm so mad at you right now. And I hung up on him. (laughs) Not kidding. And uh, so I gathered myself, call him back. I said, Kenny, I was praying this morning. The Lord said, if you ask me to go with you, I'll go. So I'm going. I hung up on him again. And so we go. So we go scouted out the first day. There was barriers up. They had taken over this whole park. Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, maybe over a thousand tents set up. And people were camping out. They had come from all over. And um, so we, we scouted out and, and we had to pay to get in. Well, uh, that night we go back to our rooms and we're going to go, you know, hit this on Monday morning. There was a drive-by shooting that night. So I'm thinking, great. <laughs> great. There's shooting going on. I was a little country boy from northern Louisiana. I'm going into a war zone here with crazy Kenny. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so we go in. So we sort of start, we just start walking through the paths. And we stop and talk to people and, and um, so <laughs> Drew said one time about uh, ministering to people you know well somebody asked well how do you what do you say when how do you open the conversation and uh, do you know Jesus <laughs> no it's hey I'm er- hey I'm Eric how are you <laughs> how easy is that yeah. and so you stand your hand uh, Bill Horn talks about that if you've ever sat in on one of his trainings the hand of God and believe that you're releasing the presence of God, the anointing of God through your hand as you touch them. And so you, then you begin a conversation. And so that's what we did. We just had conversations with people as we walked through this whole thing. And, and people, uh, we, we prayed with people and, and people got saved. Some people chose not to. People got uh, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, the, the street, the tent that was right where the drive-by shooting was, that lady came out. She got filled with the Holy Spirit. I would say that that shook her up a bit. <laughs> These bullets are flying past her tent. And uh, p- we prayed for healing for people. Well, we saw these people down on the field gathering us. I went over to the fence because they didn't look like the other people. <laughs> they looked different than the other people. And I'm looking around and said, who are you guys? They looked back, they said, we're Christians. (laughs) We are too. (laughs) 
So we all converged together on this softball field, and God had brought in 20 to 30 Christians from all parts of the country that had flown in on the same day for the light to invade the darkness. So now these people actually had a grill. They were grilling hot dogs. So now we got a line of people coming to us. Because if you can meet their physical need, then you can get to them spiritually. So now we're, you know, they had a little kiddie pool baptizing people. And, and I mean, it's just a wonderful time. What, well, the, this must have upset the devil. Because we're wide out in the open now. So I see this guy that has on like this, the plastic like Thor hat with the horns or whatever. Isn't that what Thor wore? And he didn't have the hammer. He had some kind of scepter in his hand. And he stood at midfield staring at us like this, real straight, standing up. And I'm like looking at this guy. I thought, oh, goodness, what is this guy doing? And he takes his, whatever he had, scepter in his hand, he slams it on the ground. The God of the North is not happy with you. <laughs> He's staring right at me. Another one. So he starts doing this like Jericho walk around our, you know, not, except, you know, not demonic little walk around our, our little tent we have set up chanting to himself, doing all this crazy stuff. And so I lock eyes with him. It's so beginning to pray in the Holy Spirit. See, we talk about the weapons of our warfare. They're not carnal, but they're mighty and they're pulling down the strongholds. We talk about Ephesians 6, helmet of salvation, uh, the, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What we don't talk about is the next verse that says, praying always in the Spirit. It's a weapon. It's a weapon. It's a weapon. <laughs> Did I look like a, like I could wield my sword? And so I, I began to pray in the spirit. Well, this, this guy and what was driving him heard me doing that. I locked eyes with him. That shit came over. Stop that. Stop that. They don't like that. The demons don't like when you pray in the Spirit. In a day of light, there will be more confrontation because the darkness is not going to like the light of God showing up. So we, we have to be ready. I'll begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. Well, that man has a choice now. He could be like these other ones that are standing in line. Or... He could hold on to what he's, what he's holding on to. So he ran off. But I'm just telling you, my point is, is that when light comes in, the darkness has to go. The people can stay. The people can stay. That's their choice. The darkness has to go. So what love does is it gets, it, it neutralizes that force that's on the people. It neutralizes it so that you could talk to the people Amen. that are bound by that force. Said it right there. Those that are oppressed by who? The devil. the devil. Those oppressed by the devil. Brother Jerry was in a mall one time. I love this story. If, do you remember this? And some lady, uh, the Lord told her, go, go to the mall and find the light, right? He was the light. So the presence of God is on him illuminating him. And this lady finds him in the mall. And so he prays for her. She's delivered from uh, spiritual forces that were holding her bound. It says that woman that was bent over, ought not she be free who was bound by Satan. So we say, well, we don't talk about Satan because we'll glorify him. No, we, we need to understand his methods and operations so that we can fight a good fight of faith. And so she, she, she found the light. That light was Brother Jerry. He prayed for her, and she got delivered that day. That's the day that we live in. It says in Isaiah 60 that the glory of the Lord, the glory 
God's manifested presence, His manifested power, His manifested goodness will be seen on you. It will be seen on you. God's glory, His presence, His goodness, His power, it will be seen on you. Because there's going to be such a contrast of light and dark. I think we ought to just thank the Lord for his presence in our life. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're with us, Lord. We thank you that your power is with us, that you never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you that you go with us everywhere we go, and we have favor. We give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Psalm 102, we'll wrap this up. Has this helped you today? Psalm 102 and verse 13 is where we'll begin. You will rise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. Verse 15, so the nations shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. Watch this now. For the Lord shall build up Zion or the church. That's what we're going to be doing from here till Jesus come is by God's glory, his increased presence and his increased power and his increased goodness in the earth for his people. He will build up the church. We will be a city set on the hill, literally. A city set on the hill whose light can be seen from miles away. There will be churches, I'm speaking by the Spirit, there will be churches that literally glow by the fire and presence of God and people will see that and stop in. I believe this church is one of those churches. He will build up the church, then he shall appear in his glory. So this will be a perpetual thing that God does until Jesus returns. (laughs) <laughs> Let me give you a couple other scriptures. Uh, let me read that in the Passion. Let's see. I'm like scribbling notes as I was standing there. You will reveal yourself to Zion or the church and appear in the brightness of your glory to restore her The body of Christ, we're talking about, when we talk about the church, the church isn't these walls. It says that Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body. So it refers to the church as the body of Christ, or you and me. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. So it says he will restore her and give her children. He responds to the prayer of the poor and broken and will not despise the cry of the homeless. So he will restore the church in the earth at this set time. Go to Isaiah 40. Verse 1. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. And cry out to her that her warfare is ended. That her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight. The rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. I'm telling you, we've entered a set time of favor where the glo- we are at the beginning of what Haggai says that the latter glory will be greater than the former glory. So in other words, greater, I've got some definitions what that means. It means exceedingly in magnitude and extent. 
So as great of moves of God that has happened throughout the last, uh, since Azusa Street, if you, if you consider uh, the, the different moves of God that happened, and you combine all of those moves of God into one move of God with all of those moves of God put together is what we just stepped into. The latter glory, the beginning of the latter glory. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's just give the Lord praise for that right now. We thank you, Lord, for your glory. So the word greater, the greater, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater. It means exceedingly in magnitude and extent, marvelous in number, in intensity, and in sound. Don't limit God about what you, how you think God ought to move Come on. Don't limit it. outside the church and in the church. You may get healed through praise and worship. You may get healed from the reading of the word. You might get healed from announcements. Don't limit God. Don't, don't think because we have a powerful worship service and we come to the word that you think we quench the spirit. The Word has power. The Bible says the Word runs swiftly across the earth. That means I can pray for someone on the phone and speak healing to them on the phone, and the Word runs swiftly across the earth to heal them. I'm telling you, God can do anything in this day that we live in. Now, does that mean that the world's going to get better? No. It's going to get worse and worse and worse in the world. That's why there's going to be such a contrast. When those people came out of Egypt, come on, y'all, I'm preaching good this morning. When, when those y'all just looking at me like, when those people came out of Egypt, it was a time where they had to now put their trust in God. They had become so dependent on the system, the world system, that's what Egypt was represented. They had become so dependent on it that they even said, can we not go back to Egypt? At least we got fed there. So it's going to be a time where God's people have to put their full trust in God. Wait, wait, wait. And his ways. Matthew chapter 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness or his ways of doing things. His ways. And all these things will be added to you. If you're going to put your trust in the world system, you will get the result of what the world system has to offer, which is corruption. The Bible says the carnal mind is enmity or an enemy of God. It's a time for us to be led by the Holy Spirit at all times. Praying in the Holy Spirit always. So that we're always led by the Holy Spirit. We'll end here, Psalm chapter 126. Hey, the worship team, come on back. Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back, or the King James Version says, turned the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. They will say this among the nations because of the difference that God has put in the earth, the set time of favor, they will say this among the nations, the Lord, they will see it evidently, they will see it conspicuously, it will be undeniable that it is God's people because he's been leaning in. He's been leaning in, ready to meet needs. What needs do you have today? I'm telling you, he is leaning in. Ready to meet your needs. 
He's leaning in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's leaning in. Yes, sir. He's, a, he's on the edge of his seat. Yes. Mm. Will you look at him? Will you let him? Come on. Yes. Come on. See, the fight in the last days is not a carnal fight. Remember, he does the work. All I got to do is believe. All I got to put do is put my trust in him. He does the world. So what that means is God will fight for you. God will fight for you. God will fight for you. The, the Israelites are standing at the Red Sea. And Moses says, stand still and see the salvation for the, of the Lord, for he will fight for you. God will fight for you. He will fight for you. Jehovah Nisi fights my battles. Jehovah Jireh meets my needs. Jehovah Rapha heals my body. Jehovah Shalom gives me peace. That's why I can be at peace in the boat in the middle of a storm because Jehovah Shalom is with me. Hallelujah. He will fight for you. He will fight for you.